this talk, I'm going to talk about some collaborative research between Washington State University, Evergreen State College, and Clemson University. This is a research project that is funded by Washington Department of Ecology and managed by Washington Department of Natural Resources. I have several co-authors on this, on this talk. Uh, this talk was put together by all of us collaboratively, but we also have some acknowledgements, acknowledgements to make in terms of personnel who have aided the project all the way from its beginning and uh, agencies that have provided uh, funding. Our project takes place in two key locations, which are shown here in the map in light green. Um, and these, in these locations, we have uh, set up a study to investigate tree water use and forest um, hydrology. In essence, these projects are designed in order to answer questions about uh, stormwater effects of forest vegetation. What is the effect of clearing vegetation uh, and trees specifically in the Northwest on uh, stormwater and water filtration. If we think about the hydrologic cycle, of course we have precipitation that we in the Pacific Northwest are all too familiar with in the middle of winter, which leads to increases in soil moisture and changes to the water table. There can be subsurface runoff, but there can also be surface runoff that can cause a significant amount of uh, impacts to stormwater systems. We also have evapotranspiration, which can come from plants that are going to evaporate water from the, uh, from the subsoil up into the atmosphere. We have canopy evaporation, evaporation of water off of tree canopies, and we have soil evaporation. There's a better way to put all this. And this cartoon shows us a nice way to think about uh, soil and uh, plant water balances and forest hydrological balances. So our project set out to capture measurements of precipitation, canopy interception of water, through fall and stem flow, water flow from, uh, from rainfall that travels uh, through the plant, either through the leaves and below the canopy or along the uh, tree stem down into the soil. Infiltration and runoff are important components to look at and we won't be talking about those today, but everything we talk about has impacts for infiltration and runoff. We'll talk about them indirectly. Um, and you can uh, categorize all of these as specific fluxes that are part of forest moisture balance or forest water balance. We have two locations here, one of them south of, uh, south of Olympia and one of them just west of Olympia at the Evergreen State College. And so we'll be talking about the setups in each of these locations, which were chosen because one represents a drier forest type and the other uh, at Evergreen is a slightly wetter forest. The goals of the study were to develop tree water budgets, compare sites and species. We chose 64 individual trees, four native tree species, two sites with four plots of eight trees, and uh, initially two years of data collection. This data collection and setup has all really been championed and run by Ben Leonard, a PhD student at Washington State University. These are some images from the initial setup uh, where trees were instrumented with sensors measuring uh, transpiration or um, water use by the tree stems. We have what weather stations that are set up. We have data loggers that are set up to capture all of the data collected by sensors and weather stations and in tree stems. The tree stem measurements rely on sensors that are placed into the tree xylem and we can measure transpiration by measuring the rate of water movement up the tree stem. We also have devices out to measure interception, the amount of water that is intercepted by the canopy and the amount of water that travels down the stem. So the spirals you see in this cartoon represent our stem flow collection um, approach. And I'll have some images of that in a second. We, the project is also measuring soil moisture and microclimate. And you can see some uh, horizontal lines there that are set up to measure uh, through fall, um, which allows us to estimate interception. We'll talk first about the probes. This is what our probes look like that go into trees to measure uh, sap flow and the movement of water up tree stems. 
the top sensor is generally heated and the bottom one is not. As water is moving through the plant, it carries heat away from the top sensor, making the two sensors sense uh, similar temperatures. So the temperatures become more similar, um, inversely proportional, proportional to the rate of water movement. It's important that these sensors are placed in the sapwood uh, of the tree. And so within trees, there are portions in the center of especially older trees that we call heartwood, which does not conduct water very actively. And then an outer band that's involved in the actual transfer of water, the active xylem. And that's what we're trying to measure. Um, in order to do this, we've had to estimate the amount of sapwood area because we're interested in both the speed of water up the tree and the area that water is moving. We typically get a diurnal pattern in water flux in these sapluck bands where uh, when the sun comes up, radiation is high and the plant is uh, photosynthesizing, it's also transpiring water. A number of troughs were built in order to capture interception. So these troughs have known areas. So each of the slits in these troughs is a, a known area to capture waterfall. And then these are placed beneath individual tree canopies. We took a, uh, a MacGyver approach to building uh, collars for stem flow. Um, so using a combination of foam and molds and some uh, clever carving, we were able to build spiral ramps around trees that collect water as it comes down and then um, uh, delivers it to buckets or jars where we will, uh, where we capture the stem flow and measure the amount of water. Uh, that trees are uh, having flowed down their stems after each rainfall event. These graphs show some of our cumulative um, uh, canopy interception uh, for different species, and they're just demonstrating that there are some differences uh, between species in um, their interception of water. Um, so the purple line in each one shows what happens when you have absolutely no canopy. And then the uh, colored lines, the other colored lines show you the buffering of the canopy, um, allowing water to not reach all the way to the soil surface and instead get captured by that soil canopy and then get evaporated back into the sky. So there's a big difference between the amount of interception that takes place in an evergreen tree versus a deciduous tree. So the bottom panel there is showing you averages uh, from 25 storms uh, by three species. And you can see Douglas fir and Western red cedar have high interception because they're evergreen and don't lose their leaves. Whereas our deciduous species in the middle of winter have low interception predictably because of low um, leaf, uh, uh, because they've dropped their leaves, they're deciduous. Here we're looking at stem flow data, um, which can be significant, especially for red alder, which seems to lead the charge here and the amount of water that's flowing down the stem uh, from the tree uh, to the soil. Uh, remember the stem flow uh, has to do with the volume of that stem and the volume of water that's intercepted, but it also has to do with the properties of the stem that allow water to move along the stem all the way to the soil. And so water has to hit that canopy and then get funneled to a central stem uh, in order for it to become stem flow. R red alder has smooth, uh, has smooth bark, which allows this to happen. Epiphytes on species like maple may interfere. We're going to talk about opportunities in sap flux studies and the sap flux component of this now. Um, so sap flux studies that actually measure the movement of water up tree stems are really valuable and really uh, relatively rare because they require a lot of in instrumentation and specialized personnel to install that instrumentation and interpret it. But they allow us a lot of opportunities. They allow us to understand our ecosystems better. They can allow us to manage our ecosystems better when we can understand better how plants are interacting with water cycles. And there are significant gaps in our knowledge as far as how different tree species interact with uh, precipitation and water cycles to affect uh, whole forest water balance. And sap flow studies or sap flux studies allow us to address this. So we're gonna go through and first 
talk about how these can help us understand our ecosystems. They can help us test long held assumptions about why certain plants are where they are. Um, they allow us to uh, address managing our ecosystems better. What's the impact of tree removal? And they allow us to address gaps in our knowledge. There are a few studies in our, uh, in our heavily forest region. So even though we have a region in the Pacific Northwest with heavy tree cover, there are not that many sap flux studies or sap flow studies like what we're describing here. So anytime you have a study like this, it's a real opportunity for learning. And finally, um, we haven't addressed it before, but I just wanna point out that these are also really opportunities for students to learn in a hands-on way. And um, that's happening here at Evergreen, right? So first, let's talk about patterns among species. Species have distinct uh, seasonal growth, and this has been recognized for a long time. So there's a screenshot here from a, a paper that is one of these critical papers in forest ecology and forest physiology uh, by Waring and Franklin, uh, describing why we have evergreen conifer forests in the Pacific Northwest. What drives that? And a lot of that can have to do with when our dry season is. Having a dry season in the summer uh, can put deciduous species at a distinct disadvantage. And if the growth seasons, the heavy growth seasons are instead the shoulder seasons like spring and fall, then uh, our conifer species are gonna be at a greater advantage because they don't have to um, deal with uh, the problems that are associated with losing your leaves when it's the ideal time to uh, photosynthesize or not having leaves at that time. So deciduous tree canopies and forests are generally adapted to wet summers, whereas evergreen trees may be more adapted to dry summers and wet winters. From this, we might ask, um, well, if species have distinct seasonal growth and tree canopies are distinct, then interception is gonna be distinct among species too. Um, water use might vary among these trees and interception might vary among these trees. This multicolored graph is like the previous multicolored graphs and that each line is showing a different species. In this case, green for Douglas fir, orange for Western red cedar, blue for big maple and red for uh, red alder. You can see that as we go from summer to fall to winter, there's a predictable decline in transpiration for all species. And then in spring, it picks up again. But what's really interesting in this graph is how much larger and how much faster the flux is for uh, species like Douglas fir and Western red cedar in the shoulder seasons. So this peak in November, high values in October, and high values in March and April for these species represent the fact that these species still have leaves present and they're still able to photosynthesize in the shoulder seasons when moisture tends to be high, temperatures are medium in our region, but our deciduous species don't have leaves. And because of that, their transpiration rates are predictably low. This is a comparison of a dry site and a, and a wet site for red alder and Douglas fir. And the black bars at the very bottom represent big storm events or rainfall events. And what we've noticed at these sites is that for a red alder and big leaf maple, we get this decline from summer when we have really high values into the fall where transpiration is gonna fall off predictably. But for Douglas fir and Western red cedar, we have these pulses or these jumps in transpiration that can occur after big storm events, particularly in the fall. So you can see that at the bottom where we have um, the circles, black circles around large storm events on the bottom panel. And then just a little bit later following that, you see these peaks or these bumps in transpiration that occurs for trees that just experienced heavy rainfall. So there's a lag effect in when that rainfall affects transpiration, but the trees uh, do respond to that. Similarly, if we looked at that first multicolored graph, there are transpiration events associated with each of these peaks that we see in transpiration by our evergreen tree species. So conifers seem to really dominate uh, this transpiration flux in the shoulder seasons. In the middle of summer, it's species like big leaf maple that are transpiring the most water out of soils and up into the atmosphere. But as we move into fall and winter, 
it's Douglas fir and western red cedar that are dominating that flux of water. So if you're interested in managing a forest in terms of its water use in the winter, you want to make sure that it's dominated by evergreen tree species. If you're trying to manage a forest to have it have its maximum water use in the middle of summer, you might do the reverse or focus on something like big leaf maple. These data come from a very nice study that was done by Spencer Vieira at the Evergreen State College. In this study, four locations were chosen underneath uh, the canopies of four different trees, the same four different tree species. Those four different locations represented different percentages of the width of the tree canopy. In each of those locations, weekly collections were made of water that made it through the tree canopy and down into collection jars at the soil surface. And what you can see here from these data is that the green and gold lines uh, tend to peak um, in the top panels um, at higher values than the blue and red lines. And this has to do with the amount of canopy interception. And so this is our Douglas fir and Western red cedars. They tend to take up more water, um, to intercept more water, and then they have a steeper drop off as you go towards the outside of the tree. This is particularly true during leaf off periods. When leaves are present, all species tend to intercept similar amounts of rain, but still western red cedar has a steeper curve where it intercepts more rain uh, near the bowl of the tree. And then as you move away from the tree, you get a steep drop off in the amount of rain that's intercepted. Corresponding with this is soil moisture, and this is particularly evident for uh, red alder, where you can see higher soil moisture underneath red alder, and at the same time, red alder intercepts less moisture. We have lower soil moisture underneath uh, Douglas fir and western red cedar, that do, and they do a better job of intercepting, um, of intercepting uh, rainfall. And this carries into um, the both leaf off and leaf on periods. So there's some obvious implications here for forest hydrology. Altogether, these data all contribute to understanding forest water balance. So these are all different components of a forest water balance and you really need to measure all of them to understand how species are interacting with things like rainfall, uh, soil moisture absorption um, and evaporation and transpiration. One final note is that in order to do a project like this, uh, it's ideal when you have an interdisciplinary approach. And so an interdisciplinary approach that has agencies collaborating, has institutions collaborating, um, you have professional scientists interacting with academic scientists, researchers, and students all uh, playing in the same orchestra uh, to produce data streams that tell us about how forests interact with uh, water. Um, it's hard to do all this kind of work alone. It takes a lot of a lot of minds and a lot of resources. And that's reflected in the data you saw here. Tonight.